near perfect. Some are better than others, but I leave that debate up to the internet. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about Phase 4. Phase 4 was big. 51 hours of programming, more than the other three Marvel phases combined. So, you might not have watched every single episode of She-Hulk or What If, and with all the multiverse and timeline stuff, it can also get pretty confusing. I mean, what the hell is going on? But don't worry, because I'm here to recap Phase 4 for you and tell you everything you need to know about how it sets up the rest of the multiverse saga. Alright, Phase 4 actually begins in another reality, in a distant future, where there is this brilliant scientist who discovers the multiverse. The multiverse is basically an infinite number of different universes, and in each of those universes there are variants. That's your other selves from these other universes whose lives took on a different path from your own. So this scientist discovered the multiverse and his multiversal selves. They share technology and knowledge using the best of their universes to improve the others. But the problem is, not all of these variants were nice guys. Some of them became paranoid and started to invade and conquer other realities, creating cracks in the very fabric of the universe. Those cracks became a giant cloud that looks like a dog. A cloud puppy? Yes, and this cloud puppy essentially eats stuff and wipes it from existence. So this big multiversal war happens that destroys everything. And one of those scientists weaponizes the cloud puppy to end the multiversal war, kill his other selves, and remake the entire timeline. Now, instead of endless branching realities, there are only a few that form a single sacred timeline. This scientist, who is now called He Who Remains, forms an agency called the Time Variance Authority to police this sacred timeline. Essentially, they prune any timeline before it can spawn an evil version of himself. And he invents a story that the sacred timeline was created by aliens called Time Keepers. And by the way, you know we cover a lot of Marvel and Star Wars content on this channel, and people always ask me how I know so much about all of that. Well, it is a lifelong passion, and I'm something of a completionist. I read all the novels, comics, and I listen to the audiobooks. And that is why I subscribe to Audible. They're the sponsor of this video. Audible features audio books like Avengers Infinity, which tells the story of what happened to heroes between Civil War and Infinity War, or the crucial audio novel Dooku Jedi Lost, which fills in Dooku's missing backstory from Tales of the Jedi and Attack of the Clones. Oh wow, that's so cool! Yes, it is. Audible features many stories from the Marvel Cinematic Universe that you just can't find in the movies and TV shows. And, as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. They have an incredible selection of audiobooks from across several genres, from bestsellers and new releases, and many, many more. All Audible members get access to a huge selection, including audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible originals. Now, these originals are top-notch, featuring renowned experts and A-list celebrities. Lately, I've been listening to Sandman Act 3, which brilliantly brings the Neil Gaiman comics to life with top-tier talent like James McAvoy, Kat Dennings, Jeffrey Wright, and more. Audible offers a great way to listen anytime if you're at work or traveling. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash screencrush or text screencrush to 500-500. Now back to what I was saying. More on the TVA soon, but first, history resumes. The Big Bang, the creation of the Infinity Stones. You guys know all that. Now, some of the first beings in the universe were these massive space gods called Celestials, and their job was to create stars and galaxies. To reproduce, the Celestials plant eggs inside of planets, and these eggs are powered by the intelligent life on the planet. The Celestials created creatures called Deviants to protect this sentient life, but the Deviants turned on their masters. So then the Celestials had to create another artificial life form to fight their rogue artificial life form, so they created the immortal space robots called the Eternals. Twelve Eternals arrive on Earth during the Paleolithic era, and each of them has a superpower used to fight off the Deviants. The Eternals become famous, and their names are repeated in myths for centuries. Gilgamesh Unkidu, Ahanch Iptik Utu. Into Kardutsu u Danutsu. Now, the Eternals have no idea that Earth has a celestial baby inside of it and that this baby will hatch and destroy the planet. They don't even know that they are actually space robots. I'm not going to name all the Eternals because that would be like a whole video, but two of them, Cersei and Rob Stark, fall in love. The Eternals defeat the Deviants and then hang out on Earth for a few thousand years until they eventually break up because of colonialism and they go explore the world. In ancient Egypt, these powerful beings interfere with humanity and the people think that they are gods. Now, these gods chose human avatars to be their voices on Earth. Two very important ones we'll need to know later are Khonshu, the god of the moon, and the crocodile goddess Amit, who judges souls in the afterlife. After she tries to eat the souls of basically half the world, the other gods imprison her inside of a tiny statue. And at some point in history, a guy named Wen Wu finds these powerful rings from space that grant him extraordinary powers. He uses them to conquer parts of China, and then to form a terrorist organization called the Ten Rings. Eventually, he meets a woman from another dimension, and they fall in love, have a couple kids, play Dance Dance Revolution, and he gives up being evil, and then she is killed, so he starts being evil and training his son to be a deadly assassin. His son sneaks away and 
starts a new identity where he hangs out and sings karaoke all the time. So time goes by and the first three phases of the Marvel Cinematic Universe happen. Iron Man, Captain America, etc. Wait, stop, hold on, rewind, to Ohio in the 1990s. This is Natasha Romanoff. She's actually a Russian child spy living with a family of spies in Ohio, OH. Her fake mom is a super genius and her fake dad is a super soldier and she and her sister were both trained in the Red Room, Black Widow Training Academy to become assassins. After this mission, she becomes an elite Russian assassin until she was recruited by a guy named Clint Barton to work for the good guys over at S.H.I.E.L.D. Natasha's first mission for S.H.I.E.L.D. was to assassinate her old boss Drakov, but she accidentally killed his daughter as well. Child murder? So Natasha joins the Avengers, they split up over a civil war, and she goes on the run. Meanwhile, her spy sister, Yelena Belova, is being mind controlled by Drakov, and then some gas frees her from this control and she and Natasha team up to take down the Red Room so they'll stop mind controlling all the Black Widows around the world. They track down their spy dad, the Red Guardian. Soviet Union's first and only super soldier. I could have been more famous than Captain America. And their mom, a brilliant scientist called the Iron Maiden. Excellent. They team off to bring down Drakov, the Red Room, free all the assassins, and they face off against the Taskmaster. Taskmaster is this elite fighter who can copy anyone's moves, and it turns out the Taskmaster was actually Drakov's daughter all along. What? Natasha defeats Drakov, takes down the Red Room, and her adopted sister Yelena Belova runs off to free the other widows. And by the way, Yelena is awesome. <laughs> Meanwhile, Natasha gets a haircut, borrows Yelena's vest. Does have a lot of pockets. Very handy pockets, yeah. And then we can fast forward through Thanos, the Infinity Stones, a snap, five years later, and then we're back to the present. Tony, Gamora, Natasha, and Vision are dead. Thor is fat, Steve is old and retired, and the Earth is kind of in chaos after loads of people were suddenly bloked back into existence. Also, Peter Parker fights a villain called Mysterio who steals Star Drone technology, and then he reveals Peter's secret identity to the world. Spider-Man's name is Peter Parker. And by the way, everybody, if you want to support the channel and support me and Doug here, you can check out our our merch store at shopzeroedition.com where you can buy your very own Doug ornament. We also have a lot of great t-shirts on sale including this top five shirt where you can use a sharpie marker to write in your top five movies or tv shows whatever you want. Just check out shopzeroedition.com for our merch store and help support our channel. Now back to the recap. So now let's talk about Wanda Maximoff. Remember she and Vision have been in a relationship for about two years. I just Feel you. Now, during that time, Vision bought her a plot of land in a small town called Westview where they could build their dream house together before this happened. Mm, what you say? So now, five years later, post blip, Vision's body is being examined by a government agency called SWORD. They're kind of like Earth's militant space agency that deals with extraterrestrial threats. So when Wanda sees that Vision is being disassembled, she freaks out and creates a magical hex around this entire small town. The hex mind controls people into acting like they're in a sitcom, like the ones Wanda grew up watching, and so Wanda creates a new Vision from the energy of the Mind Stone. Wanda. Welcome home. Now for a while, all of this is very mysterious and confusing. Meanwhile, this pocket sitcom reality attracts the attention of two malevolent forces. There's a powerful witch named Agatha Harkness who has a super evil magic book called the Darkhold. And then there's the agency Sword who sets up a perimeter around the town to study what's going on. Hey, what the hell is going on? The Sword team is composed of Jimmy Woo from Ant-Man 2, Darcy from the Thor movies, and a grown-up Monica Rambeau from Captain Marvel. Agatha starts messing with Wanda inside of the hex, escalating her trauma, wild conspiracy theories about Mephisto, Not the beast! and then Wanda creates twin boys who end up having superpowers. Now Monica goes back and forth through the hex a few times, gets superpowers, different sitcom genres, and then there's the reveal. Oh my god, I was wrong. It was Agatha all along. Now we learned that Wanda has always had powers since she was a kid, and the Mind Stone actually showed her a vision of her future self and activated her powers completely, and that she's actually destined to destroy the world as a malevolent force called the Scarlet Witch. Meanwhile, Sword has reassembled Vision. They power him up, send him into the Hex to apprehend Wanda. He keeps hitting himself, hitting himself, and fake Vision ends up giving Tucker Carlson Vision his memories. I am Vision. So now there's actually a Vision like running around out there somewhere who's wider than a Wilco concert. Wanda gains full control of her powers, traps Agatha in a sitcom form, Hiya, hun. And then Wanda releases the people of Westview, sadly having to say goodbye to her sons and the Vision. So long, darling. Ha! You're crying! Wanda goes off to be alone, gets really good at using the Darkhold, and her sons call out to her from the multiverse. <laughs> 
And then Monica is like sent to space or something. But Wanda is not the only hero dealing with the trauma of the blip. There's also Sam Wilson, who doesn't feel like he can live up to the name of Captain America. So he donates his shield to a museum. This pisses off Steve's old friend Bucky because he feels like that Sam is not living up to Steve's wishes. Now, meanwhile, the government immediately takes the shield and hands it to the first Dollar Tree Steve Rogers they can find, a guy named John Walker. Walker, Sam, and Bucky are going after a terrorist group called the Flag Smashers. Or what do they do? Uh, basically, they like things better during the snap and they want to go back to living in a world without borders. Because, look, the reemergence of 3 billion people has caused a housing and food shortage around the globe. Also, the leader of the Flag Smashers, Carly Morgenthau, has taken Super Soldier Serum. So, they need help tracking down these Flag Smashers. So, Bucky breaks Baron Zemo out of jail. He parties. <laughs> And they go to an Anything Goes country called Madripoor, where Sharon Carter is either working for or is a mysterious villain called the Power Broker. Anyways, they track down the guy who created the Super Soldier Serum. The secret dies with him. You know the drill. Walker takes the serum, goes nuts, and kills a guy. Afterwards, Sam and Bucky fight him for the shield. Walker is court-martialed, and then Sam and Bucky fix the boat. Sam has a meaningful, deep conversation with the first black Captain America from the 1950s, and then he decides that he is ready to use the shield. Bucky gets him a new suit, and Sam gives a speech that saves the day. You've got to do better, Senator. The Flag Smashers die, Zemo's in prison in Wakanda, and John Walker is recruited by a woman named Val to be... A U.S. agent and he's gonna be on a special CIA squad called the Thunderbolts in phase five. All right, now, meanwhile, remember when Loki stole the Tesseract at Avengers Endgame? Well, that event actually caused a dangerous branching timeline that threatened the sacred timeline that I talked about earlier. So this Loki variant was arrested by the TVA, but before he could be pruned out of existence, Owen Wilson recruits him to help track down a female variant of himself. And above all things, what Owen Wilson really loves is a jet ski. Because they're awesome. So, Loki tracks down this variant who is called Sylvie, and he finds out what she really wants to do is kill the Timekeepers because they ended her whole reality. She and Loki do eventually find the Timekeepers, but discover that they're just robots. Robots are evil. Loki is pruned and sent to a planet where Eliath is eating the other Lokis. Meanwhile, Owen Wilson discovers that the Timekeepers are a lie and that the TVA workers are all variants who had their memories erased, so he rebels against the whole darn system to help Loki. Who had a jet ski? That's what I'd like to do. Meanwhile, Loki and Sylvie open a hole in time and go to the place of He Who Remains. It turns out that spending millions of years all alone and guarding a timeline has made this guy a little crazy. Ages and ages of cosmic harmony, hence... You're welcome. And now he wants Sylvie to take over, kind of like a Hoovy and Willy Wonka. Sylvie kills him instead, the timeline splinters off, and then the leader of the TVA, Ravona Renslayer, talks to this little cartoon who says... But he thinks this will be more useful. Who? So, Ravona goes off in search of someone who is actually running the show and pulling the strings. Loki returns to the TVA and finds out that Owen Wilson doesn't even remember him, and an evil variant of He Who Remains has indeed conquered the TVA. I mean, what the hell is going on? All you really need to know is that after the show Loki, the multiverse spins out of control and multiple realities are created. There's a reality where zombies take over Earth, where Ultron wins, and eventually a cosmic being called the Watcher assembles heroes from different realities to protect the multiverse from an evil Ultron that has all the Infinity Stones. And speaking of the multiverse, remember Peter Parker? Mysterio revealed his identity to the world and is making his life a living hell. He's being attacked in the media. Governments around the world launch investigations into the murderer known as Spider-Man. He's harassed on the street. Murderer! And worst of all, his friends won't get into college because of him. Now, a really good lawyer named Matt Murdock gets him out of legal trouble, and then he goes to Doctor Strange to ask him for some magic help and make people forget that he was ever Spider-Man. Strange casts a spell, it goes wrong, and it ends up opening up holes in the multiverse and drawing in people who know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Hello, Peter. So, all these villains from other Spider-Man movies come into his reality. Peter tries to cure them, but then the Green Goblin kills his Aunt May, and then he finally learns the immortal words. Somehow Palpatine returned. Sorry, I meant these words. And with great power. There must also come great responsibility. Peter is joined by Spider-Man from other realities. This guy. <laughs> and of course, this guy. <laughs> Together, they cure the villains one at a time, but the spell is going out of control, bringing in everyone from the entire multiverse who knows Peter's identity. And get this, Doctor Strange has to cast a spell so no one even remembers that Peter Parker exists. Which is really a shame for Ned, because during this movie, he finds out that he's got magic fingers. I just wish we could see him. 
Now, Strange's new spell reverses the other spell, but it means that Peter Parker no longer has any friends, family, or contacts with Stark Industries, or even a fancy suit. So, the movie ends at Christmas time, with Peter living in a crappy apartment and fighting crime in his ordinary cloth suit. And while we're talking about Christmas in New York, there's Hawkeye. He's been enjoying his time with his newly blipped kids, watching Broadway shows. I could do this all and still not over losing that. But now let me introduce you to Kate Bishop, the number one Hawkeye superfan. Clint saved her life during the Battle of New York, inspiring her to become an archer and a skilled fighter. She accidentally steals his Ronin suit from an underground auction, making her the target of criminals called the Tracksuit Mafia. Remember, during the blip, Clint went around in this suit assassinating different criminals because he felt like they didn't have a right to live since his family had died. So there was a lot of this. If you like pina colada. So, Kate Bishop has become the target of the tracksuit mafia. They are run by a deaf assassin badass named Maya Lopez, and actually Ronan killed her father just a few years back. Maya's boss is Wilson Fisk, the kingpin who runs a lot of the organized crime in the city and normally fights this guy. And if that wasn't enough, Kate Bishop's mom is in league with the Kingpin, and she actually hires Val to hire Yelena Belova to take Clint out of the picture. Now, Yelena has blipped and come back, only to find out that the other widows were freed and Natasha was dead. She blames Clint, so this is her way to get revenge. But she also stops along the way for mac and cheese. It's really tasty. Really tasty. So, Yelena and Clint fight emotional catharsis. She made her choice. We're gonna have to find a way to live with that. Clint, Kate, and some LARPers take down the tracksuits. Maya realizes Kingpin was manipulating her, and she probably blinds him here. Sometimes family doesn't see eye to eye. And finally, Clint returns home with Kate to burn the Ronin suit and pass on the Hawkeye name to her. Now, out there in the multiverse, there is a young girl named America Chavez who has a superpower to open portals into the multiverse, and she's looking for a way to leap back home. Wanda Maximoff tries to steal America's power so she can use them to find her sons out there in the multiverse. And by the way, the Darkhold has made Wanda like Putin level evil at this point because it channels the dark magic of the elder god Cthone. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, good, Cthone, got it, got it, got it, Cthone, yeah, okay. Right, so Doctor Strange and Wong save America's life and then Wanda attacks Karmartage, lots of wizards die, and America and Strange go on a trip through the multiverse. They land in a universe run by a group called the Illuminati, basically alternate versions of the heroes that we love, plus some fan casting. <laughs> So, then we learn about something called incursions, when two universes collide and one of them has to be destroyed to save the other. It turns out that you can use that super evil book, The Dark Hole, to dreamwalk, that is, to leap into your multiversal selves. But, this action is like super evil and causes an incursion that will destroy one or two universes. So, of course, Wanda's evil now, so she dreamwalks and decimates the Illuminati. She kidnaps America so she can steal her powers, and then Strange and a Christine variant fight his evil self on another world. So then, Strange has to dreamwalk into his variant's corpse to fight Wanda, but he realizes he can't control everything in the world, so instead he gives America the weirdest pep talk of all time. When you're gonna kick that witch's ass. America controls her powers for the first time, sending Wanda into a reality with her kids so she can scare them. This snaps Wanda back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity! And so she comes to her senses and destroys the Darkhold in every universe and maybe herself in the process. I'd buy that for a dollar. Everything is fine, Strange has moved on from Christine, but he still has the Darkhold's evil in him, and then he meets Charlize Theron, who says, You caused an incursion, and we're gonna fix it. So the two of them run off to save universes from incursions. So now over to San Francisco. The San Francisco tree. <laughs> where Wen Wu is once again running the Ten Rings and he sends his minions to capture his son, Shang-Chi, and by extension his friend Aquafina. All right, so Aquafina and Shang-Chi go on the run and they find Shang's sister, Zhe Ling, who runs an underground cage fight where we see Wong fight the abomination for money, but it's actually kind of a scam. Maybe you'll start controlling those punches like we practice. Wen Wu finds them, captures them, takes them back to China where they're his honored guests. And he tells them that he's actually trying to get to the hidden city of Ta Lo where his mystical wife was from because she's being kept behind a portal to another dimension. So Aquafina, Shang-Chi, and Zhe Ling think oh, that's BS. So with a little bit of help from Iron Man 3's Trevor and Morris, <laughs> I can see you. They reach Ta Lo before the Mandarin does. Michelle Yeoh's there and she tells them that they guard the world from a great evil that is actually tempting Wen Wu to open the gate like it's the history eraser button. Can he withstand? 
and the temptation to push the button that even now beckons him ever closer. When Wu's forces show up, go to war with Ta Lo. He opens the gate. Demon starts sucking out people's souls. It's got a good dragon in it. Shang-Chi controls the Ten Rings, defeats the evil dragon, and his sister takes over his dad's criminal organization, R.I.P. Lin Wu. Afterwards, Wong, Bruce Banner, and Carol Danvers meet Shang-Chi and tell him that the Ten Rings activated some kind of beacon as soon as he started using them. First time you use the rings, we felt it. And right around this time, a bunch of earthquakes start to happen because that celestial baby inside the planet is about to hatch. So now let's talk about the Eternals. Cersei and Rob Stark have broken up, and now Cersei is dating Kit Harrington, who has a weird problem with his uncle. And then Kit Harrington is no longer in the movie. That was fast. What do you mean he's not in the No time. He's not in the movie. Selma Hayek is the leader of the Eternals, and she tells Rob Stark that they are actually going to hatch a space baby that will destroy the Earth. But after humans beat Thanos, now she's having second thoughts, so Rob Stark actually has her killed by the last deviants on Earth. But those deviants actually absorb her powers and get smarter, so they start hunting down Eternals. Alright, so the Eternals get the band back together to stop the deviants before Cersei learns about the space baby, and then they all have this ethical dilemma. If they let the baby live, then it will create more galaxies and life. But if they abort the space baby, then we get to keep the McRib. Er, that is a tough one. I know, right? So the Eternals split. They fight. Some of them die. Poor Gilgamesh. And eventually, they all form a uni mind, so Cersei can turn the Celestial into stone. Wow, so I bet everybody on Earth is, like, freaked out about a giant sticking out of the ocean. It's barely mentioned. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Afterwards, some of the Eternals are taken to the Celestials for judgment, while the others go to warn the other Eternals out in the universe about the Celestial Babies and that the Celestials are actually evil. So then, they meet a teleporting troll named Pip and Thanos' brother and fellow Eternal Star Fox, played by Harry Styles. Wait, Thanos was a space There's robot? no time to explain, we have to move on. And Kid Harrington gets this evil sword that belonged to his uncle, and he starts to touch it when Blade the Vampire Hunter shows up and says, Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? But Blade is off screen, so all that's in a different movie, and now, my god, this face is long, let's talk about Moon Knight. A mercenary named Mark Spector has an abusive childhood, so he invents another identity for himself, Stephen Grant. Mark has a dissociative identity disorder, meaning that essentially he is different people inhabiting the same body. Later in life, he becomes a mercenary and he's on a mission to Egypt with an archaeologist who is killed and then Mark is left for dead, but he survives by swearing to the god Khonshu that he will be his avatar in the 21st century. That is my moon knight. So Moon Knight's got powers and stuff, he's practically invincible, there's a god in his brain, but he also periodically lives life as another guy named Stephen Grant. Stephen? With a V? Mark marries Layla. Now she is the daughter of that archaeologist who was killed on that fateful mission, but she actually doesn't know that Mark has any connection to that. And gradually, Stephen becomes aware that someone else is living in his head. Let me save us. Meanwhile, Ethan Hawke forms a cult to the god Amit, and they're trying to free her so she can do this to the people who are unworthy. Mm, what you say? Mark, Layla, and Stephen go on a treasure hunt to find Amit's tomb. Ethan Hawke gets there first and kills Mark slash Stephen. In the afterlife, the two of them work through some symbolism, resolve their issues and come back to life. Meanwhile, Layla becomes an avatar for a hippo goddess, Ethan Hawke frees Amit, Amit fights Khonshu, and when all is lost, Mark blacks out and suddenly everything is fixed. Khonshu agrees to free Mark and Steven from their service, but it turns out that there was actually a third personality named Jake who loved killing and still serves Khonshu. Meet my friend, Jake Lockley. And now let's go to New Jersey and talk about a fangirl named Kamala Khan who loves making YouTube videos about her favorite hero, Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel. Kamala doesn't know this yet, but her great-grandmother is an alien called a Jinn from another dimension. Now back in the 1940s, they found a bangle in the Temple of the Ten Rings that has the power to send them home. But since doing this would probably destroy Earth, Kamala's great-grandma says nah and then decides to fall in love and have a kid instead. The Jinn catch up to her and kill her during the partition of India and Pakistan. And the bangle is then passed down through the years to Kamala. One night, she sneaks out to go to an Avengers convention, and the bangle activates powers, and she slowly adopts a superhero identity. She goes up against Damage Control, that's the government agency who arrested Peter Parker and are in charge of, like, policing people with powers. She meets another Jinn, falls for a half-Jinn boy named Kamran, fights the other Jinn, and then goes to Pakistan to solve the mystery of the bangle. In Pakistan, she meets a group called the Red Daggers, who protect Earth from the evil Jinn. There's a fight, and then Kamala time travels to the partition, where it turns out she was the one who actually saved her grandmother's life. Now, this is called a closed loop kind of time travel that does not create a branching timeline, and oh my god, that's what Kang wants to do. He wants to break the time loop. That's a whole video idea right there. We have to do that. Anyways, Kamala helps her friend Kamran to control his powers, fight off damage control, and then she gets a new superhero identity, Ms. Mom. But later, her super genius friend Bruno discovers that she didn't get powers from the Bengal or because she's part Jin, but because her DNA is mutated, and she is a mutant. And later, her bangle activates and she switches places with Captain Marvel.
which takes us right up into the cosmic stuff with Thor Love and Thunder. Wow, how much more Phase 4 is there? Only about 16 hours. So the last time we left Thor, he was a husky gentleman and hanging out with the Guardians of the Galaxy. He goes on missions with them, drops the weight, and generally tries to avoid thinking about how all of his friends and loved ones are dead and in Valhalla. Meanwhile, there's an alien named Gore, whose daughter dies of thirst and starvation. When he prays to the gods for help, they mock him. No, sorry. There's no eternal reward for you, dog! And so, Gore becomes possessed by this evil necro sword, kills the gods, and then makes a vow. Oh, gods will die. So, Gore goes on an off-screen killing spree, killing gods, and while all this is going on, Jane Foster has stage 4 cancer and she is going to die. See, when she and Thor were together, they drifted apart because both of them were afraid of losing someone that they loved. But the more he pondered a life with Jane, the more he feared losing that life. And although Jane didn't want to admit it, she was scared of loss as well. But Thor asks Mjolnir to protect Jane, so when she becomes sick, Mjolnir calls out to her from New Asgard, which by the way is doing great under the leadership of Valkyrie. It's become an economic power, a tourist destination, and they even mock the global genocide committed by Thanos. Mjolnir gives Jane powers and she becomes the mighty Thor. Gore attacks Asgard, reunites Thor and Jane. Jane? And then Gore kidnaps all the children of New Asgard. Afterwards, they all go on a quest to Omnipotent City to gather an army of gods to defeat Gore, but instead they accidentally kill Zeus, steal his thunderbolt, and now Korg is just a face. Afterwards, Jane is like, I'm dying, and Thor is like, let's make out. And then they go to Gore's world, and guess what? It's a trap! Turns out that Gore just wanted Thor's hammer Stormbreaker to create a Bifrost to go to the center of the universe, and then ask a cosmic god named Eternity for one wish. Oh gods will die. Gore does steal Stormbreaker, and we find out that Jane's hammer is accidentally killing her. That hammer is killing you. So, Thor goes to the center of the universe, rescues the kids, and gives them powers with the Thunderbolt, and then Jane shows up and dies. She dies? She dies, except she doesn't. She goes to Valhalla with all the other dead characters. Why? So they can come back in another movie. That's great. So, Thor convinces Gore to wish for his daughter to come back to life. So now, Thor is raising his daughter, and her name is Love, and she's also got cosmic powers. Wow. Right, and Zeus sends his son Hercules to go out and fight superheroes. You understand me, Hercules? Do you understand me, my son? Yes, father. Also in space, the Guardians of the Galaxy have become respectable. They bought the Collector's old base Nowhere and seem to be using it as a base to fight galactic evil. Now, Nowhere is being administered by a talking space dog named Cosmo. Cosmo? What use is telekinesis if you can't even aim? You wanna do it? Do it! But Peter Quill is all depressed because Gamora is gone, and so Drax and Mantis decide to kidnap his hero, Kevin Bacon, to cheer him up. You would love to come with us. Hey. Hijinks ensue, and Kevin Bacon decides to stay on Nowhere to help bring Christmas cheer. I got some friends here that kind of need to learn about Christmas. Afterwards, Mantis tells Peter a secret that Ego is her dad and that Peter has been her brother all along. What? Now let's go back to Earth where Bruce Banner is spending some quality time with his cousin, an accomplished lawyer named Jennifer Walters. Now a Sakarian ship shows up, those are the people from Thor Ragnarok, causing them to have a car wreck, and then some of Bruce's blood leaks into one of her open wounds. Now she has become She-Hulk. But unlike her cousin, she's not angry all the time. Angry all the time, angry all the time. Well done. As a Hulk, she's actually quite calm and well-mannered. I have a serious conflict of interest. This man tried to kill my cousin, Bruce. Afterwards, she gets in a fight with a superpowered influencer named Titania. She goes to work at a law firm specializing in superhuman law and goes to court against Titania, hits this, talks to the fourth wall. Just remember whose show this actually is. And her cousin Bruce goes to space and then she's attacked by man babies on the internet. Wong shows up, there's a Daredevil team up when this happens. Morning. And of course, the best character on the show. Madison is with two ends. One why, but it's not where you think. Also, she gets the abomination out of jail so he can start a cult, but he's actually a really nice guy now. Next time you think of Josh, remember everyone we meet, no matter how much they hurt you, is a lesson learned. Anyways, there's a big ridiculous fight that gets out of hand, so Jennifer just talks to the camera, okay. travels into the Marvel Studios offices, I said right now. and then talks to the creator of all Marvel content, a robot named Kevin. I don't understand. Is anything real? So they have a conversation where Jen rewrites her own is this, ending. Is, this a, is she Hulk a god? What's happening? Bad guys are arrested and Hulk shows up with his son at a barbecue. You know, because this. Family. What, what is happening? The, what's going on? Are we even real? I mean, you're not. Your footage from earlier. This is you right now. I have no idea what is happening right now. And uh, Wong breaks Abomination and I have jails because they're best friends and they can watch TV or something. And now, Werewolf by Night. 
So a monster hunter named Ulysses Bloodstone dies, so his estate holds a competition between different monster hunters to win his most lethal weapon, the Bloodstone. This competition includes his daughter, Elsa Bloodstone, and a secret werewolf named Jack Russell. Now the competition to win the Bloodstone is to fight and kill a monster on the house grounds. And it turns out that this monster that they're pursuing is actually Jack's best friend, the Man-Thing, and that he is actually here to rescue him. I'm gonna figure out where to put this and I'll come get you. I'll find you, I don't know. Jack and Elsa fight off the other monster hunters. He turns into a werewolf and then Elsa inherits the bloodstone and the entire manor while Jack and the Man-Thing enjoy a cup of nice hot liquid. Hot liquid is the best. High five. And meanwhile, a new global superpower has emerged, Wakanda. Wakanda is the only source for the world's most powerful element, vibranium, but the nation is mourning after the untimely death of their king, T'Challa. How did he die? An illness that he kept secret from everyone. That is so sad. Yes, it is. So Shuri blames herself for not being able to replicate the heart-shaped herb, and now she's angry all the time. Angry all the time, angry all the time. Meanwhile, the other nations have acquired a vibranium detector that finds this mineral under the ocean surface, but they're attacked by a race of water-breathing sea people called the Talakon. You see, like 500 years earlier, around the time that the Eternal split up, the Mayans were being slaughtered by colonizers. So one of their gods led a shaman to a vibranium-fed plant that allowed the people to breathe underwater and build their own kingdom, safe from the colonizers. The firstborn of this new tribe was called Kuku Khan. But my enemies call me Namor. Namor can fly, he's invulnerable, super strong, and he builds a sprawling civilization for his people using the vibranium under the sea. So they don't want humans to interfere with their world. So Namor threatens to attack Wakanda if they don't track down the scientist who made this vibranium detector. The Wakandans ask their old friend Everett Ross for intel, and he gives them the classified information that this detector was actually designed by a college student named Riri Williams who moonlights by making her own Iron Man suit. So Shuri and Riri go to Talakon, where Shuri sees that the people there are actually quite nice. Namor even gives her a piece of jewelry made from the magic vibranium plant that gave them all their powers. But Queen Ramonda sends Nakia, to T'Challa's former girlfriend, to find her daughter and bring her home. She kills one of the Talakons, which sparks a war between these two nations. Big battle. Wakanda loses, and sadly, Ramonda dies. And while all this is going on, we find out that Ross's ex-wife is actually Val, who's head of the CIA, and that she knows he's been committing treason and she places him under arrest. Also, the US government's official policy becomes regime change in Wakanda, but more on that in another movie. Afterwards, the Wakandans prepare for war against Namor and Talakan. Riri makes a fancy new Iron Man suit for herself, Shuri synthesizes the heart-shaped herb and becomes the new Black Panther, and Wakanda goes to war with Talakan. Doesn't go too well for Wakanda, except Shuri does use her science skills to beat Namor to a pulp, and rip off one of his wings. But in the end, they decide to make peace together and form an alliance in case colonizers do decide to come for them. M'Baku probably becomes king of Wakanda and Shuri meets her brother's long last son, T'Challa Jr. And that is phase four in 32 minutes. Did I leave out anything important? Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. <laughs>